let's get going here and uh, continue our look at the Cretaceous Caliogene extinction. So, we were last, uh, in the last lecture, we began to look through the phases of the effects of the impact of the asteroid in without the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. So, phase one, that was the actual shock wave, the blast coming out of it, things like the tsunami, and so forth. Uh, what's going to be devastating for a huge region of the Western Hemisphere, uh, but really isn't the mass extinction generator per se. Uh, but we started to get to some of the things that actually do have you know, globally catastrophic effects. And so we moved into phase two, where this huge chunk of Mexico is blasted into uh, into well, space, or at least high, high altitude. And the first, so phase two is the heavier material that rains down all over the Earth right away. It comes down on ballistic pads, re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, heats up on the way down, and we saw that thermal pulse. So anything that's opaque, that's exposed on the surface, is getting baked to some degree or other. And there's still a matter of debate as to how long that baking effect would last. Was it just minutes? Was it hours? Either way, it's pretty devastating. But there's another aspect to uh, phase two, because not everything that's coming down burns up in orbit. Some of it makes it to the ground level. And there's a fair amount of evidence that there's a global forest collapse at the end of the Cretaceous. Enough of that material, just a tiny fraction of it, but since there's so much, a tiny fraction is a lot of it, is hitting the Earth as solid objects, uh, that are, of course, hot. They're igniting the forests. Um, and so that globally, there may have been the collapse of forests as, a, uh, as an ecosystem. So you know, any, spot is, any spot with forests will have forest fires. Forest fires are a normal part of forests. It's not unnatural. But this is a case where pretty much every forest in the world is probably experiencing a forest fire. That's not to say 100% of every tree was burned down, but a sizable fraction were. And just as reefs are a main center for biodiversity in the sea, forests are a main center of biodiversity on the terrestrial realm. And so, you know, well, here's um, somewhere in Western North America, you know, 66 million years ago, and here we are in Transylvania with the giant pterosaurs, which were locally the apex predators, you know, getting some uh, cooked small dinosaurs and other animals for once, but. Uh, but not going to last long after that. And uh, so, you know, those are some big effects. So here we have the asteroid incoming. Curiously, the couple species shown here were actually tens of, uh, tens of millions of years too early for the asteroid, but hey, that's a little closer. So we've got the asteroid coming in. This obviously is close to Mexico. If you can see it, that scale. There actually is good physical evidence of the, uh, both the forest fires and the after effects. Uh, for instance, we have lots of ash deposits at that layer, so little charcoal remains. And also, uh, the pollen and spores that are there. Now, pollen and spores actually preserve really well. The external structure, the external material, pollen and spores, is quite durable. It's a very important part of the terrestrial fossil record. So here we see under magnification, so you know, 100 nanometers, um, sorry, micro, uh, 100 micrometers, um, Pollen and spores are the stuff in red, and then the black material there is charcoal, so burned plant material. And it turns out, when you look at these boundary clays, these, or these boundary layers, we find that at the layer of, or right immediately above, the layer where we have the impact of debris coming down, the amount of ferns increases a huge amount. In fact, it's often called the fern spike. And other types of plants, go down greatly in terms of their abundance. Now, that's not that much of a surprise, although it is nice to have it confirmed. If you go to the modern world, ferns are often among the first plants to recolonize after a forest fire. So here's a modern uh, forest that is set to a fire, and the ferns are doing really well, as well as some of the trees are popping up back up as well, you know, the ones that were there as seeds. So ferns get back out there. They're disaster taxa, as we call it. They, they do well after disasters. Um, and so it was back then. In fact, there's also a shorter-term fungus spike 
um, right immediately on top of all this. So before the ferns get really going. And that's just, the, we saw that at the end of the Permian, uh, at the Permo-Triassic extinction event, technically from the beginning of the Triassic. And that's basically the fungi eating the decayed remains of, in this case, the Mesozoic. And this fern spike is found all over the world. So it was first recognized in places like the American West, what we now see in New Zealand, and other spots around the world. Okay, so the material that came down right away caused devastation the day of the impact. And, which is why I said, you know, that was Earth's worst day ever. But a lot of that debris stayed up in the atmosphere. And that had very long, much longer term effects. Now, remember when I talked about it last time, um, the Alvarez team pointed to this effect as the primary causal, or the primary killing agent of the KPG extinction, or KT at the time, as they called it. Um, and it still seems to be in a very important part of that. That's what's called impact winter. So insolation, insolation is incoming sunlight, not insolation, insolation. Incoming sunlight is blocked for years as the world is plunged into darkness. The material stays up in the stratosphere. The stratosphere is the sort of second level of the atmosphere. We live in the troposphere where there's weather. Above us is the stratosphere. And there's actually not much weather there. And because of that, if material gets there, it stays there for a long time. Well, with blocking insulation, making the world dark, plants on land, algae at sea or in the water, their productivity crashes. They're not getting sunlight. They may not be dying per se. They may be going into stasis. They may just you know, go into a rest mode. But they're not active because there's nothing for them to eat. There's no sunlight. Well, if they're not producing food material, the herbivores starve. And then the carnivores do really well for a short time, and then they starve because you know, they don't have food. But on top of that, the temperatures themselves are going to drop down because, of course, sunlight is what keeps us warm. And if the whole world is plunged into night for years upon years, the, te the temperatures decrease. And I'll show you a new model, relatively new model, that shows how much it decreases. Now, when the dust clears, land temperatures would recover quickly. And in fact, as we will see, they will do more than recover because of some effects of the impact. But it takes a lot longer for the heat to percolate back down to the deep sea. And there's some evidence that the deep ocean took something like 10,000 years to recover. So impact winter is coming. So this is from a recent model, 2016, looking at the effects of the impact. So we're counting down six months until the impact, and bam! Now, just want to show here, minus 40, this is centigrade scale, but if you want to calibrate, minus 40 is the same in Fahrenheit, too. That's uh, the one point where the, where the, the two um, things cross. And see, so we're now five years after the impact. It's still cooler than it was before, you know, ten, uh, um, uh, six years after the impact. And in fact, it looks like global temperatures dropped by about 26 centigrade degrees. That's a huge drop. That's a, much, much bigger than the difference between now and the peak of the last ice age. Between now and the peak of the last ice age is something like 7 or 8 degrees centigrade. This is 26 degrees centigrade for 3 to 6 years, so nowhere near as long as an ice age. It is a super chilling event, but not, a ton, not long enough to build up glaciers and have them run over the continents and so forth. And even after the uh, impact even after the dust has begun to clear, it takes a while. It's more than 30 years before you get back to the opacity in the atmosphere, the clarity in the atmosphere that it was before. So this is an extraordinarily intense event. But once the dust clears, temperatures start to rock it up because, as it turns out, the spot that the impact hit was mostly, at least the surface layers, carbon of rocks, limestones and dolomites. Well, when you oxidize carbonates, you get carbon dioxide. So when you burn that, there's lots of CO2 that was 
sent into the atmosphere. Now, this is in addition to the CO2 that was bubbling out from the Deccan traps, which was already, remember, raising temperature. If you saw that global warming event associated with Deccan traps, and now a huge release due to the oxidation of these rocks. Now, when the dust is in the atmosphere, the extra CO2 doesn't do anything. The greenhouse effect doesn't work if you don't have incoming sunlight. But when the dust clears and the sunlight percolates, it gets through the atmosphere, hits the ground, the ground re-radiates it as infrared, and then it gets trapped because of the CO2, temperatures go up. And so, for instance, here's the impact site. There's Chicxulub. Over here is a site called El Kef, which incidentally is where the, uh, um, the base of the Cenozoic is technically defined. So you actually have that continuous sequence of rocks there. And at that spot, uh, people studying that see a 100,000-year duration increase of temperature by about 5 degrees based on what was there before the impact um, due to this increased CO2. So this would be shallow water deposits. So shallow marine communities show 5 degrees warming. That's comparable to the sort of higher end of our, you know, our concern about global warming in modern times is we want to keep it down below 1.5 degrees if possible. It used to be 2 degrees, and people point out even that could be catastrophic. So this is a, at the higher end of what might be likely and lasting for about 100,000 years. So because this was a one-day event, at least the trigger was a one-day event, unlike the other big five mass extinctions, there actually is an anniversary to it. We just don't know what day that is. So there is an anniversary every year to the impact. And who knows? Maybe it was Christmas. So, um, all right. So that gives us a look at the devastation that would be caused by Chicxulub. Now, that's not to say that the environmental changes produced by the Maastrichtian regression had no effect. And it's not to say that the effects of the Deccan traps were felt by the world. But the Chicxulub event is an extraordinary one in the history of life. It is extraordinarily intense. It involves rapid changes in multiple different directions. Um, and, uh, and we're learning more about it all the time. And in fact, there is a locality in North Dakota nicknamed Tanis uh, by uh, the team leader, who is a big fan of the Indiana Jones movies. And, uh, and Tanis is featured in the original in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and at that site, there's evidence that, well, evidence of a lot of different things. Now, there have been lots of reports in the popular press about the Tanis site, which have not yet been backed up by actual uh, scientific uh, papers. But there is some that has been. And one of the things is it looked at first as if there was this splashing of tsunami deposits. But actually, it's too far away. And it's sort of the long environment for a tsunami per se. Um, so here's some of the lo local stuff. Some of the stuff there is pretty standard model late Cretaceous boundary event. So, you know, you've got clays uh, produced by the stuff falling down, you got the fern spike, and then eventually you recover. You got the tectites down there and so forth. Shocked quartz, so those things I talked about last time. Uh, charcoal. Uh, but also the splashing effect of this in the sediment. What's really cool is some of the stuff involving the fossils. Now, in this case, it's not dinosaurs, it's not pterosaurs, it's not even mammals. Uh, it's something much more mundane for many of us. Oh, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, it's fish. Now, there's actually a high concentration of these spherules at this site. That's one of the things I think that attracted them to begin with, to recognize this was a vacuum boundary thing. You know, you could, you know, spherules you can actually see in outcrop form. So these are those tectites, the melt blasts. So this is bits of Mexico that have rained down on North Dakota. And this is in cross-section. You can see how, how one of these little micrometeors, you want to think about it, micrometeorites, splashed through layers of mud. So that's its own little tiny crater. 
and there's some more of it. Let's move on. Um, the site actually happens to be a wonderfully preserved site for fish, and the fish in question are fish that we still have today, or at least close relatives, sturgeons, gars, paddlefish. They're actually really common fish to find out in the, um, in the Lake Cretaceous. Like, you find them all the time. You find the scales all the time. What this is really nice is that they're relatively complete. They got buried in this rapid uh, event. But what's even more cool, so you can see how wonderfully preserved they are, the nice tail of that fish. So this is a modern paddlefish here. That was a sturgeon tail before. Here's a paddlefish. And paddlefish live, that's just, well, paddlefish live by uh, filter feeding. They're sort of ram scoops. They go through the water with their jaws open, and they pick up particles of food and capture them in their gill breakers, or well, in their gills. And then uh, they digest those plankton and other bits of food that are in there. Well, inside these fish's gill rakers are tectites. These were fish that were swimming around with their mouths open, scooping up food, when, hey, look, someone's throwing fi fish food in the water. I see these particles coming down and grabbing them. They were in the midst of grabbing these little micrometeorites. These little bits of Mexico that got lodged in their throat when these guys died. So these fish we know died on the day of the impact, within hours of the impact. And that's really cool. Now, its location is actually pretty far from the, uh, from the impact site itself. So this is the impact site itself, and there's the site for Tanis. And people working out, some of, the, some of the geophysicists working out there, suggest it's not actually the tsunami that we see in terms of the deposits there, but what's called a siche, um, which is basically the splashing, the splashing around of a basin of water. This will happen like when there's an earthquake. You, if you want to like, do a, a YouTube search on earthquake swimming pool, swimming pools where they're getting shake, uh, uh, shook by an earthquake, you'll get these splashing going around within it. And uh, that's thought to be what's happening here. The basin of water, the, the last remnant of that interior seaway, was getting splashed back and forth, rather than this being the pulse of material coming along. So that's pretty cool. But that's just one spot. Although people say that they're actually, maybe not with regard to the fish with the actual droplets in their gill rakers. That's not very common. But people have, when that what Tannis paper came out initially, some other people said, hey, we've seen sites like this elsewhere in North Dakota and Montana and so forth. So people are on the look for that. But let's think about this broader pattern of the extinctions. Let's think about, you know, last, the, the first part of this lecture series, I talked about the groups that went extinct. But I didn't actually try to profile them, per se. Well, we see that plankton, and nekton, nekton are, are swimmers, suffer worse than benthos, which are bottom dwellers. And plankton include the larvae of ammonoids. Remember these ammonoids, these um, spiral-shelled cephalopods, are unusual for cephalopods in that they have planktonic larvae. Their larvae float around in the water column rather than most of them, which lay their eggs, much larger eggs, down on the seafloor. And the babies live in the benthic community, that's the bottom dwelling community. So we can see that pattern. We also see that photosynthesizers, like coccolithophorids, and the creatures that feed directly on them, either the coccolithophorid eaters, or the things that eat the coccolithophorid eaters, or the things that eat the things that eat the coccolithophorid eaters, and so forth, those tend to die out with a preferential rate, as do those with symbiotic algae. So the rudest corals, remember, these uh, reef-making corals probably had algae in their body tissues, just the way giant clams do, to help them feed. These guys suffer extinction more strongly than those that don't have that. Also, we see that vertebrates in the pelagic realm, so plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, hesperornithines, and or were larger, like Oh, actually, also, vertebrates in the plastic realm would also include things like uh, big sharks, the giant ram scoop feeding fish, and so forth. 
uh, tend to suffer worse than those that fed close to shore, or those that were smaller, or those that had lower metabolic rates. And you see overall that the bottom feeding animals, typical clams, crabs, etc., they suffer extinction far less severely. And it's noteworthy, bottom feeders have a pantry. That is, they're feeding from the gunk that's rained down for years or centuries or more on the seafloor. And they're just picking up those particles of food. Whereas creatures that are eating the photosynthesizers are only eating fresh food. The stuff that's up there in the water column. So that's the general pattern we see in the marine realm. In the terrestrial realm, we see, or on continental realm, if you want to put it that way, freshwater animals and animals that feed from the freshwater ecosystem tend to survive well. So we saw like those champsosaurs, those long-snouted uh, aquatic reptiles, they survive pretty well. Um, aquatic turtles survive pretty well. The freshwater turtles. Uh, many freshwater fish survive very well, etc. Large animals all go extinct. And medium-sized animals with high metabolic rates, like smaller dinosaurs, uh, typically suffer, or pterosaurs for that matter. And those are all animals that have a high absolute amount of food they need. Additionally, large animals, um, it's hard for them to get out of the way when you know, the sky is burning. In contrast, smaller animals, like most man well, various types of mammals and birds, and medium-sized animals with low metabolic rates, like some land turtles or some crocodilians and so forth, lizards, snakes, tend to survive better. That's not to say they survive 100%. We have extinctions among mammals, as I talked about. We have extinction among birds. And these are animals that have a lower absolute amount of food that they need. Something that's actually interesting is that there were a group of pseudo-tortoises, at least in Asia America, so Asia and North America, at the end of the Cretaceous. They were giant, medium to large sized land turtles. They are not the same group as um, Testudinidae, which are tortoises. By the way, Testudo is not the name of the diamondback terrapin. That's Malaclamus, it's not in Testudinae. Testudinae are tortoises. Um, Tortoises evolved after the extinction event. They have replayed what this earlier group did because those land pseudo turtles, pseudo tortoises rather, get wiped out entirely. So, one of the big factors on land is indeed size. And as I talked about before, size could be a very important factor when you're trying to shelter. But let's take a look at the continental pattern in more detail. So, let's compare the two dominant groups of birds that existed in the later Cretaceous. The Enantiornithines, which died out utterly, and Aves within the larger group Euornithes. At the time, most of the Enantiornithines seemed to have ate live food, like insects, fish, small vertebrates, etc. When they were in the terrestrial realm, and they tend to live in forests. And that's especially more true of the late Cretaceous. Earlier on, they were more diverse, and there were a lot of uh, semi aquatic ones. We don't see those so much in the late Cretaceous. These guys die out utterly. In contrast, Aves, which is the group that survives at the late Cretaceous, many of them fed either from seeds or from near shore marine realm, things going out and picking up like sea worms and clams and so forth, and tend to live on the ground or at the shoreline. Now, subsequently, of course, Aves has evolved into every sort of bird lifestyle imaginable. Of the groups that were around at the time, it seems to be, and they tended to survive. Now, beaked birds, Aves, things that do not have teeth, that don't have snouts, but actually have beaks, can access all sorts of food sources that are, again, stored in the ground. They don't have to be super fresh, per se. You know, seeds can last for a long time. Worms would be relatively undisturbed by the baking of the world. Uh, Bottom-dwelling sea organisms 
Even in shoreline environments, they had a food source, and these guys could feed on that. In contrast, in antiornithids, probably needed to catch live food. And then that becomes rare, they preferentially die out. And additionally, um, in a study looking at where different groups of modern birds nest, it was seen, and I talked about this before, so this is just modern birds shown here. Uh, so this is one of those ring, I, I, I show very few of these ring cladograms that hasn't been that important for us so far. I show it this way because there's so many species here, you can't just stretch it out. So oldest is in the middle, branching out from that. Brown represent creatures, birds that nest on the ground. And we see the basal branches are almost all ground nesters. So the ancestral members of Aves were ground nesters, not tree nesters. So the thought here is, the hypothesis here, is that enantiornithines, or at least late Cretaceous ones, were tree nesters. And with the global forest collapse, their habitat is gone that they need to reproduce. In contrast, Neornithes, or Aves, as we call it in this class, were primarily essentially ground-dwelling birds. Their habitat might be disturbed, but at least it still exists. And so between their food sources and their nesting sources having a differential fate, the Enantiornithines die out, and Aves, or at least many branches of Aves, manages to survive. So here we have an, a proto-member of Aves, in this really hard time, but you know maybe it's not so hard for it. Okay, so let's think about this with respect to the effects of Chicxulub. For the terrestrial realm, it looks like the Easy Bake Oven, uh, the phase two, that's the primary filter. Are you getting baked or not? But after that, you know, baked or you know, forest collapse, and then you have to survive the impact winter as well. That'll pick off some of the stragglers. And of course, you'll have to survive the greenhouse summer after that as well. But um, the easy bake oven seems to be the primary filter there. For the marine realm, remember, easy bake oven, phase two, wouldn't have been as important because it's not really heating up the water. It's heating up the upper most micron of water, you know, a couple microns of water, and that's it. Instead, it's the collapse of the photosynthetic pathway that's the primary factor there. And so we have you know, the dawn of a new era. The survivors of the event are the ones that will colonize to create a new world. Now, that's a reasonable scenario, but we have some complications in the study of this extinction event. For one, there's differential sampling. That is, for instance, Western North America has an extraordinary record going up to and through the event, both in terms of the geology and the paleontology. So the rocks and the fossils. We don't have as good record in many other parts of the world. So we might get a biased view of this event, at least with regard to the terrestrial realm, because it's so concentrated on Western North America. And in fact, there is the possibility that different effects were more important in different regions. Once we get better samples from those, uh, that would be something that we can take into account. Also. With regard to the timing of the Deccan Traps versus the Chicxulub, in particularly terrestrial deposits, where the rates of sedimentation are slower and where they're more discontinuous, you don't have continuous sedimentation, an event that, took, that takes 250,000 years or so to play out and an event that took a few weeks to play out might be hard to distinguish. In the marine realm, it's easier because you have relatively constant sedimentation coming down, and you can tease that out. But um, it might be a lot harder in the terrestrial realm. So some decon traps may have more of a role than is appreciated. It's just hard to demonstrate that. 
Well, that's about, you know, the extinction in general, but this is a dinosaur's class. So what specifically is going on with regard to dinosaurs? So in order to really study an extinction event, you can't just look at the boundary. You want to have a relatively continuous series going up to and through the boundary event to see if there are changes going on. Particularly if you wanted to ask the question, was it an instantaneous extinction or was it something that was gradually creeping up on them? And so ideally, we would want to have not just the latest Maastrichtian, but as much of the Maastrichtian as possible, and even the stage before that, called the Campanian. Now, there aren't too many places which have such a good record. So here we see the time scale going up to and through the boundary. And these are all the spots in the world that have dinosaur sites from the Campanian. And you see, there's a you know, pretty good record. And those are the ones that have sites from the Maastrichtian. And again, actually, it's not a bad record. But in neither case are they evenly distributed around the world. And particularly, if you want to ask the question, was there a gradual decline of dinosaurian diversity before the impact, as some people have postulated? Or was it relatively constant until the end? You know, we would like to see that record. So, in eastern North America, in Australasia, uh, including New Zealand, we have some late Cretaceous dinosaurs, but it's low diversity of what we know at present. Neither of those places have as good a de massive deposits which are exposed where we could actually see a lot of the species. Europe actually has a pretty good record. And we have some from the you know, early Campanian, mid-Campanian, late Campanian, early Maastrichtian, late Maastrichtian. The problem is we don't have them on any one spot. We have you know, one here in France, and then one in Spain, and then one in Hungary, and then one in you know, Romania, and so forth. The reason that's significant is, if you remember, Europe is an archipelago at this time. It's a bunch of different islands. Looks like, say, Indonesia would look like if we were to look at it from above. And therefore, when we see differences from formation to formation, are we seeing changes in the overall region over time, which is one hypothesis, or are we seeing just the different populations that existed on different islands, which is another hypothesis, and one which currently it's difficult to overturn? You know, which of those two hypotheses explains the differences from the different formations? So that's less helpful than we might like. India and Madagascar both have good fossils from the end, but only from particular time slices. They don't have a continuous series. Asia, continental Asia, has some wonderful sites. But the problem is the Campanian sites tend to be best preserved from deserts. And the Maastrichtian sites are from different spots, a little further north, in northern China and Siberia, um, where they were wet sites. They were actually very similar to, eastern, uh, to Western North America. So there's a lot of differences in them, but those are differences of environment, not necessarily differences in the evolution of these groups. Oh, I should have had another arrow here going to Africa. There's a Kenyan site. That's the latest Cretaceous, but we just have one site, really. And the stratigraphy remains, it's getting better, but in the stratigraphy in uh, South America is still being worked out. So we have lots of really good sites, but it's the matter of putting them in the proper order to see what those changes represent. Additionally, there seems to be geographic differences between northern and central South America and southern South America. But, as emphasized before, western North America has a phenomenal record been studied since the 1870s, really. You know, crews have been working out there every summer since. Oh, there's low diversity fauna. There's, there's Africa for you. So the Campanian and the Strictian record of what we call Laramidia, Western North America, is phenomenal. And it's phenomenal for a couple different reasons. Oh, there's back up here. One, at the time, a lot of sediment was forming because the Rocky Mountains broadly speaking, the Western Mountains, were undergoing a new burst of activity. And so they're being thrust up, and so they're eroding, and so lots of sediment was accumulating. 
And it was accumulating relatively short distances. So it was piling up. So a big continuous record with lots of great dates because of the ash beds from all the volcanism. And so you know, we have really well dated sequences of fossils, plot fossils of fossils. Boy, I should back up. Additionally, fast forwarding 66 million years or more, nowadays it's an easy place to get to. It's not like mounting an expedition to Montana or Alberta or Saskatchewan or New Mexico involves you know, huge outlay of resources and so forth. You just drive there. You fly there and get a rental or something and drive there. It's easy to get to. It's dry. And so it's easy to see the fossils. It's not like where we are. And so there's lots of factors that make it an easy place to study. And so we have this wonderful record of fossils in Laramidia. Um, and in fact, it's a very familiar assemblage of fossils that we've seen. Now within them, there's three, the big three. Uh, they're big three because A, they're big. And also, they're extraordinarily well studied. We know the phylogeny uh, and the anatomy of these forms pretty well. The tyrannosaurids, the ceratopsids, and the hadrosaurids. So tyrant dinosaurs, horned dinosaurs, duckbills. But there's a lot of other ones uh, who have good information uh, to varying degrees. These include various types of ankylosaurs. Uh, these are not shown to scale, by the way. Ankylosaurs, pachycephalosaurs, ostrich dinosaurs, uh, truodonts and dromaeosaurids, um, small ornithopods, primitive neoceratopsians, oviraptorosaurs, and at the very tail end of the Cretaceous, titanosaurs show up in North America. So those give us some information as well. Oh, by the way, the North, the, the North American titanosaurs seem to be immigrants from South America. So for the others, for the especially for tyrannosaurids, ceratopsids, hadrosaurids, we've got the phylogeny worked out really well. We've got the, um, uh, the anatomy and so forth. And so they've given us a lot of information. The other groups, to varying degrees, have as well. And so here is data that I have, sort of the raw data of species in, throughout time of the major groups. <laughs> if you care, there they are. And this is tracking them through the Campanian and the Maastrichtian. And it's not super important. Let's concentrate, though, on the herbivores. Because you know, the meat eaters don't show that much the way of uh, interesting changes. But there are interesting patterns among the herbivores. So hadrosaurids, ceratopsids, ankylosaurs, and some of their kin. And here they are rescaled to 100%. And we see that over the course of earlier here, the KPG boundary there. We see that some groups die out before the KPG. For instance, short-snouted hadrosaurines, they're gone. It's only long-snouted ones that make it all the way to the end. Lambiosaurines in North America don't survive to the end. We have thousands of skeletons of hadrosaurids from the later part of the Maastrichtian. Not one of them is a lambiosaurine. At least not yet. The centrosaurines, remember one of the two major branches of ceratopsids, they don't make it to the end. And in fact, when we see who's around at the end, it's ankylosaurs, it's long-snouted hadrosaurines, and it's chasmosaurines, the long-snouted um, ceratopsians, long-snouted ceratops, like triceratops, that are around at the end. Now, that's where Chicxulub falls on this graph. Could the disaster of Chicxulub have explained these extinctions? Question mark. Yeah, you're shaking your head, and that's the correct answer. Because what would have to happen for this extinction, or this event, to cause these extinctions? It's simple. It's, go for it. Well, we know, when the, we know when the impact happened. So it would have to travel backwards in time. The, it is, you're, you're sitting there, you're saying, why is he asking you for something that stupid? I'm asking you for something that stupid because I want you to understand it. That's the point. 
These changes earlier here cannot be explained by an impact that occurs on the course of one day. Because a shock wave, powerful as it was, can't propagate backwards through time. Similarly, Dekod traps only started about a quarter million years before that, so that can't explain these changes either. So there are definite changes going on in the makeup of the community of dinosaurs in the Maastrichtian, in the best studied place of the world, that shows something's changing. Something consistent with the Maastrichtian regression. So it is fair to say there are some overturning of the population of dinosaurs and other animals and plants in North America, at least, in the run-up to the end that's due to the Maastrichtian regression. Would this have produced a mass extinction? Probably not. Probably not. There are extinctions that happen throughout Earth history. You know, some groups disappear, other ones reappear. Some groups do well, some do less well. But at least some of the changes going on do seem to be tied into this. Now, why might this affect these groups? Why would, restriction, why would regression affect these things? Remember, one of the main effects of a regression for the terrestrial realm is changing habitats and changing growing seasons, and these are herbivores. So maybe the preferential food sources for some of these groups or the microhabitat that they prefer to eat in was going away. And that the, is it, it's interesting that it's the longer stouted forms in all these groups that survive. What does that mean? I don't know. But it is an interesting pattern. So yeah, shorter snout taxa tend to die out earlier, long snout taxa make it all the way to the end. It's a pattern. What does it mean? We don't know, but it's there. There's another pattern that's long been noticed. When we look at the dinosaurs found in the latest Maastrichtian, the last couple million years of the Cretaceous in Western North America, they are almost all of them the largest member of that clade throughout its history. Tyrannosaurus, the largest Silurosaurus, the largest theropod that we know of. Pachycephalosaurus, by far the largest Pachycephalosaurus. Tornosaurus and Triceratops, if they're different animals, among the largest ceratopsids. There was an earlier one that's arrived. Thescalosaurus, the largest of the Thescalosaurids, so the small Hypsilophodont gray forms. Ankylosaurus is the largest Ankylosaurid, one of the largest thyreophorans. And Edmontosaurus may not actually be the largest of the Hadrosaurids, but it does get pretty damn big. In fact, neither of these specimens shown here are fully grown. So these forms at the end of the Cretaceous are all really big. Now, what does, why would that have anything to do with extinction? Well, we'll think about that in a bit. So here we see, you know, over the course of the regression, again, a changing aspect of the environment. But now let's think about something else that's going on. Over here, we have different regions, somewhat difficult for creatures to get to from one to another. So, you know, so here's a region that might have diverse forms, and here's one, and here's the one. And indeed, when we look at the populations of dinosaurs earlier in the Campanian, there's a lot of regionalization. So south southwestern forms, central forms, northern forms look a little different. As we go up into the late Cretaceous, the latest part of the Maastrichtian, it's the same batch of critters, basically, from the south to the north, with the exception of the, the giant sauropods are stuck down here in the south. So you're sort of evening everything out. There's not as much diversity anymore. And then yeah, now Allosaurus comes in from the south. Never gets that far north. Um, so it's sort of limited in the southern half of the range of Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. So here's a possible scenario for the Liramidian dinosaur evolution towards the end. In the Campanian, you've got diverse habitats that are separated from each other you know, due to the high sea levels. And that supports, overall, a higher level of diversity. Now, there'd be fewer individuals of any one species, but there's more species overall. That's all a little more tight ways little more ways of doing things represented among all these species. The Maastrichtian Brugrin begins. The seaway is draining away. There's less habitat diversity. These creatures are now flowing more freely from the southwest all the way to Canada. And so the overall diversity of dinosaurs is going down, perhaps, in this scenario. 
And then we get to the latest Mastrichtian. And sort of we've homogenized dinosaur populations. Competition seems to be favoring larger and larger forms among each of these clades. And that's great. It's great in good times to be a big individual. But what happens if suddenly, you know, like a bolt from the blue, your resource base is knocked out? Being a giant is now actually lousy. And additionally, if you have fewer species around, that means less variation. And so less of a chance that whatever trait would be most favorable to survival happens to be represented by some species in your clade. But as this says, this is a Laramidian dinosaur story. So this wouldn't necessarily apply to anywhere else in the world. And so it may have something to do with regional extinctions, but not the mass extinction overall. Now, dinosaurs in general, though, and for that matter, the big pterosaurs that existed at the same time, some are pterosauria in the later Cretaceous was limited only to giants, they might have had a vulnerability due to the way they grew up. And that is, remember, dinosaurs and big pterosaurs would go through ontogenetic midships. So unlike a large placental mammal or a modern bird, where you get born, you have a parent taking care of you until you are essentially adult size, and then when you are no longer being provided to by your parent, you have the adaptations of your adult. You are ecologically the same creature. In contrast, dinosaurs, other than modern birds, and pterosaurs, you're born, your parents take care of you for a while, but then you're out, for many cases, you're on your own, and you're a small animal, and you have a small animal niche, and then you're a medium-sized animal, you have a medium-sized animal niche, and then you're a large animal, you have a large animal niche, and then you're a giant animal, you have a giant animal niche, and maybe you've got a super giant phase. Well, for these things to survive in a hard time, Every one of those niches has to remain viable in the new disaster setting. Failure of any one, any point of failure along the way, means you're not going to be able to be reproducing. And that lineage is terminated. And so for little guys, you either survive or you fail. You only have, the, you only have two life phases, babies and the adult morph, basically. The dinosaurs, pterosaurs, you have multiple points of failure, and so that makes them more vulnerable at these hard times. So yeah, shooting stars don't make dreams come true. And this, the artist here, by the way, said, uh, uh, Nathan Pyle said, this is the saddest cartoon he ever drew. <laughs> So here's the, the asteroid. It's going to go, it loves dinosaurs. He wants to go to the dinosaur world. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, so then after the effects of the impact, maybe with contribution from decon traps and then a strictian regression, uh, we lose a world of dinosaurs. So now remember, Timmy, in case of emergencies, you put your arms over your head, duck and cover. Is that why the dinosaurs died? So, um, so what killed the dinosaurs? Well, first of all, remember, dinosauria survives. They're still with us, chirping away. But those aren't the good dinosaurs. Okay, there's the We know that some groups that have been doing well in, say, Campanian Laramidia, things like Centrosaurines, Lambiosaurines, they die out during the Mastrichtian. So they're not actually, they're, at least their regional extinction is not due to the impact. But that the latest Mastrichtian non avian dinosaurs are wiped out by the effects of Decon traps and or Chicxulub, and I would say the vast majority of evidence points towards it being Chicxulub. And from that, a new world would arise. But I want to point out, here's an alternative view for those of you into the flat Earth. So Chicxulub impactor hits the Earth, and it flings the dinosaurs off into space because it disturbs the flat Earth. So. Can't say that I don't provide alternative views here. So that's that. When we come back on Friday, we will pick up in the world after the Cretaceous and then talk about dinosaur survival in the Cretaceous, both in terms of 
biologically, but also in terms of actually collecting fossils. So as we move to humans and dinosaurs. 